Each of us carries a divine longing. We want to live free. Fully secure. Welcome to the hills, all of you watching online, and I'm just always humbled when I hear literally from people around the world who watch, thank you for joining us, and all of you in person at the North Richland Hills, West Fort Worth, or South Lake campuses. We're in a series called Delivered, and what we're doing is using the incredible story of the Exodus, when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage as a platform to consider the ways that God wants to deliver us, that he's called us to walk in freedom. And this weekend, we want to look at one of the most oppressive kinds of captivities we can find ourselves in, and I call it the bondage of inadequacy. Now, to set up this message, let me tell you a story Many of you know I was a roommate in college with an author named Max Licato. Now, some of you may not know Max Licato. When I say an author, he's not just a Christian author. He's one of the most successful authors in literature history. He sold about 200 million books. Consequently, he's one of the best known followers of Jesus in the world. And for many years, he's been pastor of a church in San Antonio called Oak Hills. And so what happens is when people visit San Antonio, they want to go hear the guy preach whose books they have been reading for years. I've seen entire buses drive up into the parking lot full of guests who've come to hear Max Licato. Because we're dear friends, I have preached for Max many times. And here's what happens. I'm sitting on the front row about to be introduced. And the host walks up and says, our guest speaker today, and then you hear audible size. Oh, I haven't even gotten up and said a single word. And I have already disappointed people. See, no one can go through life without experiencing disappointment. But no one should go through life feeling like they are a disappointment. Yet so many do. The bondage of feeling inadequate is pervasive, and it is oppressive. And most of the sign we do in life is at ourselves, because every one of us have had moments in life where we thought, I'm just not enough. How would you fill in this sentence? Because we all have... I am not smart enough. I am not attractive enough. I am not popular enough. I am not healthy enough. I am not wealthy enough. I am not talented enough. And I believe social media has made these feelings of inadequacy a thousand times greater. Because every time we check one of those platforms, somebody is posting and essentially saying, my kids are cuter than your kids, and they do better in school, and my job is a lot better than your job, and my vacations are a whole lot cooler than your vacations, and my food is even tastier than your food. And oh, by the way, the reason I post my opinions on so many things is, frankly, my thoughts are smarter than your thoughts. And so, we often feel as significant as a scrubby bush in the Sinai wilderness. And that's how Moses felt for decades as he tended his family flocks. You remember that Moses grew up as Egyptian royalty, but he had a burden for his 
ethnic people, the Israelites. He wanted to deliver them from Egyptian bondage. He murdered an Egyptian thinking he would incite a rebellion and he could lead the people out and they did not follow him. It was an epic fail. And it affected him. His confidence tank had been so emptied by that attempt that now Moses needed to be delivered from the bondage that he was in. So last time, Taylor helped us see how God is a revealing God. He comes to us and lets us know who he is. And in a burning bush, he announces his intention to rescue the Israelites. And Moses is totally on board. Forty years ago, that was the burden of his heart. He is absolutely convinced this is the right mission, and he's equally convinced that Yahweh has chosen the wrong man. So let's go back to chapter 3 and look at how God speaks to Moses and how Moses responds. God says, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, one of the most important questions you must answer is the question, who am I? And you are getting an answer to that question every day, whether you realize it or not. Who am I that I should go? And it's not so much an identity crisis Moses is having. He's having an inadequacy crisis. He has spent four decades, and every day he has relived his epic fail and doubts about himself and about his capacity and about his usefulness. They have settled deep into his soul. He cannot imagine a future in light of his past. So essentially, he says, Yahweh, right plan, wrong man. Now, you might be a little confused. Well, pastor, two weeks ago, you say the reason Moses failed was because he's too full of pride. Now he's being humble. He's saying, who am I? Isn't that a good thing? Listen, who am I can reflect meekness of character, but it can also reflect a weakness of character. So I'm going to give you four big takeaways today, and here's the first. Do not confuse the virtue of humility with the prison of inadequacy. They're not the same thing. True humility denies self, but hu true humility never denies the capacity of God to use you. See, Moses is feigning humility because he's covering for his reluctance. He's covering for his fear because he doesn't want to fail again. He's covering for his faithfulness. In fact, he's covering for his wounded pride because God keeps trying to talk about the mission and Moses keeps turning the conversation back to himself. Look at chapter four, verse one. Moses answered, well, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Notice. Moses is making it all about him. And so what God is going to do is shift the narrative back to himself. And again, when God reveals himself, and he does, we don't have to go and try to find out who God is. God lets us know who he is. And God says, I am. And whenever God tells you more about who he is, he's going to expect more of you in light of that revelation. And so God's going to go deep into the revelation of who he is. Is. So let's read now chapter 4, verse 2. And then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. And then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord. Is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. 
And then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Now what's going on here? You see, under the guise of humility, Moses has contended, I have a credibility deficit. I got nothing to offer here. Why would anyone believe me? They didn't listen to me last time. So what has changed? Now, this is important. I want you to notice God does not respond by sending him to Barnes and Nobles and saying, go check out the self-help section. He doesn't say, Moses, you're such a glasses half empty guy. You need to think more positively. He doesn't say, Moses, I got this new book, How to Win Friends and Influence Pharaohs. You need to read it. He doesn't say, Moses, every morning, get up, stand in front of your mirror and say to yourself 10 times, I am Moses and I am a bad man. Because Moses' problem wasn't his small view of himself. It was his small view view of God. And so this is a big takeaway. Write this down. That deliverance from inadequacy doesn't require a bigger view of your potential, but a better view of God. That the answer is not to fix I am not. The answer is to be fixed on I am. Now, that's God's name. He has revealed that to us. And honestly, Our finite minds are too small to wrap around everything God is saying by that name. God says, I am. I am uncaused. I am unchanging. Every attribute I have is eternal. My love, my mercy, my grace, my power, my wisdom, my faithfulness, my goodness. I never run out. I never lack anything necessary to accomplish whatever I have purposed. Moses, this is not about your I am not-ness. This is about my I am-ness. You see, when God calls you or sends you on a mission, he never asks you to do anything you won't need him to do. He never says, you know what? You don't need me for that one. You go take care of it and I'm going to stay here. God's response is always, I am sending my enoughness with you. And so what God does is give Moses a show and tell demonstration to make the point that I am is enough. The first thing he says is throw your staff on the ground. He did, and it says it became a snake, and the text says Moses ran away. Good for you, Moses. That is at least one way we are alike. I have told you before, I am irrationally afraid of snakes. I remember as a little boy, I was in something called the Y Indian Guides, and we went to a camp in East Texas, and a park ranger came to teach us about snakes, and especially about poisonous snakes in Texas, like the moccasin and the copperhead and the rattlesnake. And he said, now, you can always recognize the dangerous snake because they have pits in their snout. And I'm about seven or eight years old. I remember thinking, you are an idiot. (laughs) If you think I intend to get close enough to the face of any snake to see if it has pits. If I see a snake, I run. And the one thing I know about snakes, don't pick it up by the tail. Which is exactly what God told Moses to do. And it turned back into a staff. By the way, one of the symbols of Pharaoh was a snake. He had a headdress with a snake on the top. What's God say? Moses, the thing you're afraid of answers to me. Put your hand in your cloak. He does it. The skin turns leprous. Put it back in. The skin is restored. Moses, the things that you fear, the things that you think are deadly, answer to me. I'm not sending you because you are so much. I'm sending you because I am enough. This mission does not depend on your reputation. It depends on my reputation. Now, you might think witnessing two miracles 
with the promise of a third would be enough to motivate and encourage Moses. But escaping the bondage of inadequacy is one epic deliverance. And you know what I mean. If you have lived for decades in the cell of I am not enough, it is hard to break free. So even after everything he's seen, Moses is still captive to his inadequacy. And he moves from claiming a credibility deficit to an ability deficit. So keep reading verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. And then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he'll be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. It's interesting that Moses says, I I just can't speak, never could. In Acts 7, when Stephen is given his sermon, he said Moses was powerful in speech and action. Here's what bondage does. It causes you to not even be able to see the strengths God has given you. You can't even see in yourself the capacity that others can see in you because you're so enslaved to the inadequate thoughts. And God got mad. Now, little Bible study tip. When you read in your Bible that God got mad, pay attention. God got angry. Why? Because this was not about Moses' lack of confidence in himself. This is now about Moses' lack of confidence in God. What he is saying is, God, you're not adequate to compensate for my inadequacy. Your I amness cannot transcend my I am not-ness. And folks, that is closer to blasphemy than it is to humility. You know, we we often read the Bible like it's a self-help manual. And the goal is to mine all these little tips on how we can have healthier and happier lives. No. The Bible is the revelation of God. Who He is and what He is up to. And confidence doesn't come from a bigger view of your potential. But it comes from seeing how big God is. And getting swept up into His purposes. So when God reveals himself and says, I am, the only appropriate response is, well, here I am. Send me. Years ago, I I remember reading about a man who wrote about his time in seminary. And each week, the school would post preaching assignments for their students to go out to smaller churches and fill in on the weekend. And one student was assigned a very small little church in the country to visit, and he thought it was beneath his ability. And he said so out loud. And as he did, another student walked by and said, you know, the world's a better place because Michelangelo never said, I don't do ceilings. (laughs) And it caused him to reflect how the world is a better place because Moses never said, I don't do deliverance. And Noah never said, I don't do boats. And Rahab didn't say, I don't do spies. And Sarah, I mean, excuse me, Ruth never said, I don't do mothers-in-law. All of us should be glad that Peter stopped saying, I don't do Gentiles. And Paul didn't say, I don't do correspondence. The world's a better place because Mother Teresa didn't say, I don't do AIDS orphans. 
Because Dr. King didn't say, I don't do jail. We all have a hope of heaven because Jesus never said, I don't do crosses. When God says, I am, he doesn't want to hear, well, I don't do. You see, God knew who you were. God doesn't make cold calls. And so to answer, I am with, but I am not enough, is to take his name in vain. You ever thought that God's got no choice but to use broken vessels? Who else is he going to call? What other option does he have? But here's the thing. Your brokenness is one of the reasons you got the call. And one of the ways to get free from the bondage of inadequacy is to reframe the way you understand weakness. You know, Paul said to the Corinthian church, God doesn't call many who were strong. Now, he didn't say he didn't call any. He said, but he doesn't call many. He didn't call many who are strong in the eyes of the world, who are wise, who are influential, who are well-resourced. Why? Chapter 4, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. God wants the boasting to be in His power, not in our potential. So here's what God does. He doesn't call the gifted. What God does is gift the called. He says to Moses, I know you're not enough, but I'm going with you, and I'll be there. I will help you speak. I will teach you what to do. Whatever God commands, God empowers So when we make ourselves available for his work, he makes his Holy Spirit available to work through us. And the result is not just our deliverance, but the deliverance of others. So I was reading one of Max Licato's books years ago, and one of my favorite illustrations I'm about to share with you. He wrote about John Eglin. I doubt you've ever heard his name. Just an ordinary deacon in a Methodist church, lived in Colchester, England. It was 1850 in January. A big storm came through. He woke up on Sunday morning. Snow everywhere. It was frigid cold. The thought crossed his mind not to go to church, but he thought, how can I do that? I'm a deacon. I should set an example. So he put on his coat and he walked six miles in the snow and the cold to get to church. Well, he gets there. Apparently, a lot of people had the thought he had because there were only 13 people there. 12 members and one guest, a 13-year-old boy. Even the minister didn't come. So Eglin heard people say, maybe we should just call off service. He said, no. Well, who's going to preach? Eglin, who had never preached in life, says, well, I'll try. So he stood up. He preached for 10 minutes. Went everywhere, making lots of points, just trying to make one. But at the very end, in an unusual display of courage, he looked at that boy. He said, young man, look to Jesus. Look, look, look. And that boy wrote later in his journal that day, and I did look. And in that moment, the fog lifted and the darkness rolled away. And for the first time, I saw the light. That 13-year-old boy's name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Eglin walked back home in the cold, having no idea and never knew for the rest of his life what God had used him to do that day. Spurgeon would go on to be the prince of preachers, lead tens of thousands to Christ. His impact is still being felt today. And it was all because one ordinary bush made himself available. That's what a lot of you did yesterday. Over 900 people in our church showed up to serve. Just ordinary bushes doing ordinary things. We cleaned classrooms and facilities and dressed up campuses. We painted playgrounds. We held day camps for some under-resourced children. 
We wrote thousands of notes of encouragement to students and to teachers and to elderly citizens. We beautified grounds. We painted apartments. We distributed groceries. We fixed up lawns for elderly citizens. We took gift bags to seniors and to the sick. We decorated baby frames for expectant mothers. We did prayer walks around local schools. Just ordinary people doing ordinary things, trusting that God can bring about extraordinary results when a bush is willing to be set on fire by God. Do you want to be free from the prison of inadequacy? Well, to do so will depend on how you're going to answer the question. Who am I? And as I said earlier, every day you're letting that question get answered. And you are never going to be free as long as you let other people answer that question. You will stay in bondage as long as you give to others the authority to decide who you are. So this past Thursday, NFL fans know it was the annual NFL draft. And the number one pick of the draft in the first round was this young man. His name is Trevor Lawrence. He was the quarterback of Clemson, now for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And you might know that he has been very public about his faith in Jesus Christ. So his head coach at Clemson was on a podcast I was listening to, being interviewed about what he thought were Trevor's potential for success at the next level. He said, oh, he'll be great. Well, what are his strengths? Well, obviously, he's got size. He's got athleticism. He's got a strong arm. He's got leadership ability. He's a great thinker and an intelligent young man. But his number one strength is his faith. And the interviewer said, what do you mean? He said, well, he's an inside-out young man in an outside-in world, paralyzed by the opinion of others. Boy, I stopped when I heard that. I hope that somebody would say that about me someday. In an outside-in world where everybody is paralyzed by what someone is liking or posting or saying about me. Coach said, this young man doesn't find his identity from the outside. It's from the inside. It's from his walk and his faith in Jesus Christ. And that is how he will face his challenges. I hope he goes on to have great success. I know Moses did. Not because Moses changed his confidence in himself, but because he changed his confidence in God and the truth that God was with him. So now I'm going to share with you the single most important thing I've learned as a minister. It's this. That freedom comes when we live from a blessing instead of for a blessing. You will never live in freedom as long as other people need to applaud so you can feel good about yourself. You will give other people the keys to the cell that you will stay in. The most important thing God has taught me that I tell every young minister I ever mentor is you have got to minister out of the blessing of God and not for the blessing of others. And so, back to speaking for Max. I remember one time after I was through teaching, a woman came up and quite sincerely said, you're no Max, (laughs) but you did okay. And as a young minister, that would have wounded me. But it didn't that day. Because in that moment, don't ask me to explain this, it doesn't happen often, but in that moment, I heard in my spirit these words. I love who you are. And I realized, she doesn't tell me who I am. 
You don't tell me who I am. I am who I am, says I am. And when you know you matter to God, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. He delivers the blessing. And the blessing delivers. And I hope that blesses you. But I want to close by talking especially to some of you listening online, some of you at all three of our campuses. And you're not very close to God right now. And one reason might be this. You don't think you're enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not holy enough. I don't have my act together enough. I'm not righteous enough. Can I give you some good news? You will never be enough. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus said, I am the shepherd, and I am the door, and I am the living water, and I am the way and the truth and the life, and I am the resurrection, and Jesus came to be your enough. And what I want you to do today is come and say, God, I am not, but you are. Cover me with Jesus. And you will leave saying, who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. So let's pray. And God, I'm praying now that all would be blessed by this word and trust more completely in your sufficiency, in your I am-ness. And I'm praying very specifically against the lie of the enemy that is keeping anyone far from you from coming to you today. I'm praying for salvation today. I'm praying for people to come today to confess, I am not, but Jesus is. And I choose Jesus. We pray this, God, for your sake and for your glory and for your name through Jesus. Amen.